All right, so this evening, as I mentioned already, we're not going to be going through our normal Bible study. This is going to be a Bible study still. We're going to be studying real closely on a few passages regarding the Passover, and hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate tonight how um, Christ is a fulfillment of that Passover. I think it's a very basic, fundamental, rudimentary um, doctrine and teaching for believers, but it's an important one to go over. And this is really just a huge, fo I mean, the, the Passover sacrifice itself is like a monumental sacrifice. It's something that, that is, has a lot of emphasis in the scripture. And then the fact that Christ came and fulfilled that sacrifice to a T, I mean, in so many ways, there's so many applications, there's so many things that were observed in the Old Testament about the Passover lamb and, and all the symbolic significance and everything. And Christ came and filled every single last bit of that uh, picture, of that representation of what was done in the past. I mean, if you think about it, just literally what happened and when the Passover was instituted for the children of Israel, it was when they were still in Egypt. They were still in bondage. They were still in the world. They were still among the heathen. They were still in sin, as it were, right? The symbolic meaning and the reference of Egypt being in bondage. And then all those plagues were happening. Remember all the plagues? Moses and Aaron were, were continued to go to Pharaoh and say, hey, let my people go. Let my people free. And it didn't matter what was done. It didn't matter what plague came upon them. Pharaoh still refused. He still resisted. He still wouldn't let them free. It took this last plague where the firstborn son, where people died, literally the, the firstborn sons died in every household that did not have the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. And that, that was the event, that was what triggered then the freeing of God's people. The freeing of the children of Israel didn't happen until the night that the Passover lamb was slain, the blood was shed, it was applied to every household of believers, and then they were allowed to go free. And they actually were, were forced out and pushed out and said, yeah, get, get out of here now. You know, we never want to see you again. That significant, triumphant event is it encapsulates the whole Passover. And then the Passover itself, you know, besides that that big abstract high level, just just seeing the, the course of events, that's the one event. They're set free, just as much as that that sacrifice that Jesus Christ made of shedding his blood is what sets us free. He's the one who makes us free. He's the one uh, that that sacrifice had to be paid in order for us to receive our freedom, in order for us to be relieved from our bondage, to be freed from sin, to be freed from Egypt, free from the world, free from all of that had to happen. But when you look at all the details then surrounding the Passover, it's, it, it points to so many different truths and so many fulfillments of prophecy, of scripture, of these, these events that they might not have even been aware of at the time. And then Jesus comes along and he just fulfills every last detail of the Passover lamb sacrifice. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament has symbolic references and points to a Savior, points to Jesus Christ, points to various elements. I mean, even from the scapegoat, you know, Jesus is the one that took the sins of the world and he was sent out while the other was set free, right? There's so many images and imagery of, of Jesus taking that, that uh, making, being that sacrifice for us and making a payment for us, but none so much as the Passover lamb. And as we go through these details, we're, we're going to start off just looking at this. And, and one more point real quick, because I, I, I was debating, and there's so many areas to, to cover in this one event. I was debating doing the timeline thing. I'm not going to do the timeline thing, but the reason why we're, we're celebrating tonight observing the the. Lord's Supper is what we call it, or communion. Those are two common words that are associated with what we're going to be doing tonight by eating the bread and drinking the unfermented wine. The, this event is a continuation, essentially. We'll see that in a little bit. But it's a continuation of this event, of the Passover. It's representative in the New Testament 
of what the, the Passover symbolized in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, there was the Passover lamb, and we'll see how Jesus Christ fits, fits this description, who was to come and shed his blood, right? So they would observe this every year at the same time, every year, every year, every year, the 14th day of the month, Abib, every year, Passover lamb, same day, same day, same day. And then guess what? Jesus came, and guess when he was killed and when he was sacrificed and shed his blood? 14th day of the month, Abib. Like on Passover, Jesus Christ died and shed his blood. He was that Passover. He is that Passover. But then because he fulfilled that, because he is that final sacrifice, there's no more sacrifice to be made. But the event is just as important as it ever was. It's just as important as it was when the children of Israel were freed from Egypt, which is why we continue to observe that great event, except now we're not going to offer a sacrifice because the sacrifice was made once for all. Amen. There is no more sacrifice to make. We're not going to slay a lamb and cut its throat and let it bleed out and do what they would do in the Old Testament Hey, Christ fulfilled that, but now we are still going to observe the shedding of blood and the breaking of his body for us, just like that lamb showed the same exact thing. Except now we're doing that without an animal sacrifice. Now we're doing it with, with other elements that are very similar, elements that Jesus Christ chose himself to use to continue this honoring and this ordinance of the Passover. It's, it's, if you want to think about it, it's a Passover for the New Testament. Obviously with some changes because we're in the New Testament, but the, the whole heart and the thought and, and what, the, what it represents is still exactly the same. So with all of that being said, by way of introduction, let's dig into Exodus chapter 12. And we're just going to look at this and, and study this real quickly. And, and we'll move on to a few other passages, but um, we'll see exactly how of a significant event this is and how it was fulfilled. Verse number one, Exodus 12, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. God starts off with this event saying, he's basically changing time and is saying, this month right now, you are going to start from this day forward counting this month to be the beginning of month for you for the whole year. You're not going off anyone else's calendar. You're not going off of the, the um, Egyptian calendar. You're not going off any, you're, you're going you're gonna to take this month right now, and this is your first month. This is your January, right? We have a month, January. Well, this is their month, Abib. They said that's the first month of the year for you. Significant event. Kind of like we're in the year 2023, the year of our Lord, right? That's another significant event, the birth of Jesus Christ. That no matter what letters... Non-believers want to tack on, so, oh, this is the common era. Yeah, yeah what does that mean? Yeah. Well, what, when did the common era start? <laughs> what happened for, for this BCE and CE? Well, what, well, but why, why was it 2,023 years ago? Oh, just because. No, not just because. Because Christ was born. Right. That's why. Yep. Well, you could try to change the name, but... It doesn't change the facts. It doesn't change the event. It doesn't change why we're in 2023 today and not 4,023 or any other number for that matter. This event, though, it's just as significant as the birth of Christ. He's saying, hey, look, this is going to be a beginning of months for you. You're going you're to take heed to this, and you're going to start your months here. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. So in the tenth day is when they select a lamb from their flock. They're going to find and make sure that they, they have a lamb set aside and prepared for the Passover. But they don't do anything with it yet. They just make sure that they have one on the tenth day. It says, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb... Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So God doesn't want them wasting a whole lamb. He's like, well, we've, you know, married couple. There's just two of us. We can't eat a whole lamb, right? So he's saying, that's fine. 
you know, join together with some of your neighbors or whatever to make it worthwhile so that you all have enough to eat, but you're going to essentially consume the whole lamb. It's practical, right? But it's also just making sure that everyone is going to be covered with this as well. Uh, the Bible says in verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. So no problems. Just as Jesus Christ was without blemish. Jesus Christ was sinless. He had no, no spot, no wrinkle, you know, nothing, no imperfection, as it were, uh, about him because he was perfect. He was sinless. A male of the first year. Jesus Christ had to be a man. Yeah. I mean, that's just another fulfillment. It's a small fulfillment, but that is what it is, you know. And, and by the way, we have a heavenly father, not a heavenly mother. Amen. In Isaiah, they, they worship the queen of heaven. Well, you know what? There is no queen of heaven. There's a father, son, and holy ghost. And these three are one. There's one God, but it's always a male figure. And the Bible says that when God created man, he created man after the image of God in his likeness. And this is nothing denigrated, denigrating towards women at all. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. God made man in God's image, and then he made woman out of man. Now, women and men look somewhat similar in the fact that we're all human beings, but there's definitely big differences in the way men and women appear, right? Our, our, our composition. And there's nothing wrong with being a woman if you're a woman. But if you're a woman, be a woman. And if you're a man, be a man. Be what God made you to be. But we're looking at facts. We're looking at the Bible. Jesus Christ was without sin just as much as he was a male, right? A male the first year is who, what, they're, what they're selecting for their sacrifice. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, verse 6, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of back and forth and you know, proving all of this from all the Gospels, but what happened when Jesus Christ was arrested, right? He was arrested falsely. They, they had all these people come up with false accusations trying to find something to stick because the Jews wanted to put him to death. Right? He went to the high priest, he went before the Pharisees, and they were all accusing him of all this stuff. And then they finally bring him forth in front of Pilate, and here and, and, and you're trying to say, hey, you're like, well, what has this guy done? Like, they, they, they can't find any fault with him. But what happened when, he, when he's presented before the people? He's pre presented before his people, essentially. He's pre presented before the Jews, and they're all saying, hey, crucify him, crucify him. Even after Pilate gives him an opportunity to say, hey, look, he hasn't done anything wrong. How about, how about I just release him unto you, right? Because at that time for the feast, he was, he was going to do him a favor every year and release one prisoner to let, set him free and show mercy and everything. And, and, and that was a, a tradition that was done. So he's saying, well, he knew that, that Jesus was falsely arrested and there's try, you know, that these Pharisees were trying to do this to him. But what happened? The, the Pharisees worked the crowd to where they're all just saying, hey, crucify him. We don't want this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a robber. He caused insurrection. You know, he caused all these problems. He was a, a bad guy, but that also shows us, you know, Jesus was chosen, the innocent, for the, for the guilty, yeah. right? The guilty was set free. The innocent took the blame. The innocent went and died, and that's what happens for us, another picture of our salvation. We're the guilty before God. We're the sinners. Yet we get to go free because Christ, the innocent, paid the price for us and, and, and died on that cross. It says, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. This is putting the responsibility on the Jews collectively for the death of Jesus Christ. It was the whole assembly. It was the whole gathering. It was all the people, essentially. We know it's not every single one individually as far as, you know, uh, um, hating Christ or whatever, but collectively as a whole, the Bible says he came unto his own, his own received him not. So looking aggregately as a whole, he was rejected. Of course there's a remnant, but that's, you know, what we're seeing here is this picture, just as much as when they carried out this, uh, the Passover sacrifice, I'm sure not every single person in all of Israel was all present at one time to kill, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's just as, uh, as 
appropriate here. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And Christ died on the cross, the Bible says in the ninth hour, essentially, is when he was saying his last words, and he gives up the ghost. And the ninth hour, roughly, is going to be, you know, uh, the ninth hour of the day, starting from, the, from the, the crack of dawn, nine hours after that. You know, you could do the math. If we, if we roughly gauge the crack of dawn around 6 a.m., okay, just, just as an average, just to get a general idea, it would be 3 in the afternoon, right? That begins the evening, Right, that's the evening hours, and if you're thinking about some time between there and 6 p.m., if 6 p.m. was sunset, that's close enough to that time when they're going to be killing the Passover. Of course, he died right before that, but it's all a fulfillment of this prophecy. So they kill the Passover lamb in the evening. They shall take of the blood. So this is what they're supposed to do, of course. We're describing the, uh, the Passover sacrifice, and this is specifically at this time before they're, they're ready to leave Egypt. Verse 7 says, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts. They put it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house. So that's the, the, the action they're going to be doing. Kind of foreshadowing of, a, of another death maybe. I don't know. By the way, on, on a cross, not on a torture stake, on a cross, don't be deceived by the Jehovah's false witnesses Amen. that want to that want to lie and tell you that the crucifixion is really just he was just hanging there on a stick. No, he was he was crucified. Okay, that's that's just ridiculous. They just, they want to have things that are different. I think just sometimes just to be different. Um, let's continue on here. So you take of the blood, strike it on the two side posts on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Look at verse 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. So we have a lot of burnt sacrifices and burnt offerings in the scripture. This is the only one that's actually doubles down and just says ma and just make sure so make sure there is you're not eating it raw and you're not boiling it you're not using any water in the preparation it must be roast with fire and as we go through this there's a reason for every aspect of the passover lamb that is uh, that that gets fulfilled by jesus christ and this is no different from the shedding of his blood, the applying of the blood to a household. Yes. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Everything, without blemish, male, 14th day, killed in the evening, take of the blood. You're going to eat the flesh. Jesus Christ said, remember that, that if they didn't eat, he, you know, he's the bread of life. And if they didn't eat his flesh, they have no life in them. It's his sacrifice, just as much as they needed to eat the flesh of the lamb, because he was the Passover lamb. He's the bread of life. He's that manna that came down from heaven. But it makes the point to make it roast of fire. Why? Because Jesus Christ's soul descended into hell. Because he was a burnt sacrifice. Yes, he suffered on the cross horribly. There was a lot of suffering going on, and he shed his blood for us and died on that cross. He suffered, but you know what? The suffering didn't stop on the cross because his soul descended into hell. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, they, they expound upon Psalms where he says, you know, um, that let me freely speak unto you, uh, Patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried. He says, therefore, speaking of the resurrection, uh, he said, and I'm misquoting this a little bit, but he said um, that, that his, his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did seek corruption. So he spake of the resurrection of Christ, and when he spake of the resurrection of Christ, he said his soul was not left in hell. Why? Because his soul was in hell, because his soul went to hell, because the Bible says Jesus Christ himself said that the Son of Man was going to be in the heart of the earth, just like Jonah was in the, in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. I mean, Jesus himself said that. 
And you could go back to Jonah and read Jonah chapter 2 and see the picture of Jonah in the whale's belly, which was representative of the heart of the earth, the belly of the earth. And you can see what he went through, and he's giving all this imagery of hell. Why? Because it's a foreshadowing of Christ's soul being in hell. There's so many ways, and I'm not going to take any more time to prove this. I've proved this multiple times in different sermons. You know, trying to say that Jesus Christ's soul didn't suffer in, cell, didn't suffer in hell is just, I, I, don't know, I don't know how you could come up with that. I don't. I can, I can know how some people could believe that if you've been taught a certain way, but once you see the truth, once you hear it, once you just look at it and say, there's so much evidence showing, there's no reason to say otherwise. And the fact that even right here, the Passover lamb, it's, it's made a specific point to say it's roast with fire. It's just as important as the unleavened bread. Leaven is symbolic of sin. So it's, it's non-leavened because there's no sin. And the bread is symbolic of his flesh, which was without sin. Which, by the way, is also why we have unfermented wine. Wine is referred to in the Bible for both fermented and non-fermented, which is literally a juice. When juice ferments, it becomes alcoholic. But when it's non-fermented, it's non-alcoholic. It's as simple as that. In the Bible, I've, I've preached this in other sermons. Again, you can look it up. I'm not going to take the time to, to dig into it too much tonight, but leaven is to bread like fermentation is to juice. Leaven is a yeast. So is the fermentation. It's, a, it's, it's like a yeast in the, in the, that grows in the, in, and does the, the conversion of the sugars into, into alcohol in a juice. So the unleavened bread shows the sinless nature of Christ's body, while the unfermented wine shows the sinless nature of Christ's blood. So we're not going to defile a representation of his blood by having it alcoholic. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 10, the Bible says, And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, what are you going to do with it? Burn it with fire. You shall burn with fire. A third reference to the burning with fire. Oh, but that doesn't mean anything, right? It, the people who want to deny Christ's soul burning in hell, how do you explain what, what does this mean? What's the point? What's the application of the burning with fire three times being mentioned? If it doesn't have a significant application to Jesus Christ's fulfillment of being the Passover lamb. I have never heard a good explanation for that, ever. If it's the cross, or it's a cross, it's a cross, then why can't it be boiled with water? I mean, yeah. being boiled with water also hurts a lot. I, I wouldn't want to be, you know, uh, thrown into a, a pot of boiling water. No, it's, it's roast with fire because it's representative of the, of the flames of hell. Verse 11, and thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So why do you do this with the Passover lamb? To escape judgment, to escape God's judgment. You don't want to face the wrath of God, then make sure that you've got the blood applied to your, to your house. Verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token. He says, this is a symbol. This is a token that's going to be to you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amen. Amen. And we know that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're putting a faith in the blood that he shed for us. And when God sees you, even though you're a sinner, even though we're all sinners, even though we still have sin, Christ's blood has, has been applied to all of you who have received Christ as their Savior. Those of you who have put your trust in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, when God looks at you, instead of seeing the sinner, he's going to see Christ's blood. And he's gonna, his wrath is going to pass over you. 
You don't have the wrath of God abiding on you, whosoever believeth. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. So this is this whole day. So you're beginning your month here, and this day is going to be set apart. It's going to be sanctified. It's going to be holy this 14th day of the month. And this is a memorial. I want you to remember this day. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So, and this is something I want you to do for all time. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now, how do I think this applies to our observation today? Leaven is, again, representative of sin. And God wants us to come to the, to the observation, to this memorial. Obviously, we're not going to be sinless. But as it were, when I went through the, um, the story with the, with the showbread, remember when David came with his men and they were hungry and they were, you know, they were trying to flee and they, they needed bread. And he said, well, hey, is there any bread here? And he said, well, yeah, there's the show bread. He says, in a way, it's not, it's not holy anymore because it was already replaced with the bread that was supposed to be the show bread for, for the next day, for that day. And then um, he said, well, if they've at least kept themselves from women, you know, like, like he wanted to make sure there was this level of, of not having leaven, right? They can't, their, their vessels can't just be full of leaven and then partaking of this holy bread. And it's a similar way with, with us, with the observation of the body of Christ it was unleavened, which is why we have unleavened bread. There's no, no, um, no yeast. There's nothing uh, in that representative of sin. But also, we ought to be working and looking at making sure that we're, we're doing our best to stay as unleavened also as possible when we partake in this. Because this, this unleavened bread, this the week of, of not having the leaven was something that you know, that part isn't necessarily representative of Christ. It's, it's what they had to do. Right? Christ is the, is the ultimate sacrifice for everything else, but this is something that, that hey, you guys need to, to not have leaven in your house around this day. Verse 16, And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that, on, that only may be done of you. So this is a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath of rest. These days were holy, the first day, the seventh day. And also, so there's the, yeah, I don't want to get into this too much, but you have the, the Passover day. It's from the 14th to the 21st is, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 14th to the 21st. Well, that's a total of eight days. The 14th is the first day is a Passover, and then you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the next day, which is then lasts a full seven days. If you do the math, you've got 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. It's eight days in total. 14th starts a Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days. So there's, there's two Sabbaths back to back. And when you look at the timing of Christ's death on the cross, no one was to be working for all the three days and three nights that he was in the grave. For the three days and three nights that he was dead and his soul was in hell, no one was supposed to be doing any work. So it's another picture of our salvation by grace through faith without work, right? Without the deeds of the law, no work being done. It's a gift of God, not of works. Christ did all the work for us. So while he was in the grave, no one was working. And no one worked again until the resurrection. It's a great picture. Which, by the way, you know, we have Good Friday coming up. Good Friday is not the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to take the time. Because if you think about this, if, if he, we, it's clear he rose again the first day of the week. Yeah. Right? We know that it's Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Right? Saturday is the Sabbath day. It's the seventh day. Okay? 
If he died on Friday and rose on Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, how many, how many nights can possibly be in between Friday night, Saturday night? Oh, wait, but he was already risen Sunday morning. Yeah. Three days and three nights, the Bible says he was in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights, he was dead. So um, that just simply does not work. Now, I'm not going to go into more detail. Some people believe he died on Thursday. Some people died on Wednesday night. We're not going to get into that tonight. Um, the fact of the matter is, it's definitely not Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that 100% for sure. It's not Friday. So, hey, I'm going to celebrate having Friday off of work. So I'm, I'm glad I work for a company that gives us good Friday off. But it's not the day, it's not the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. So just celebrate Easter a little bit early by having the day off of work, I'll take it. But um, yeah, don't be deceived by, by that. I mean, people tell you that, oh, Jesus died on Good Friday. Well, what does the Bible say, right? And you can, you can prove that is absolutely not true. So um, anyhow, let's keep going. I didn't I want to get into all the timeline. There's, that's kind of a, a lot to, to dig into. So um, what I want to focus on is not only the representation here of what Jesus did for us, but also what he actually went through. And we'll get to that in just a minute. I want to finish. Let's get, let's get through this real quick. Uh, what verse did we just read off, read there? What was the last verse we read? 16? All right, let's keep reading 17. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. And again, re you know, referencing it, this is meant to be an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. That's what I was talking about, the 14th day, 21st day. It says, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether it be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened, in all your habitation shall you eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Oh, and one other point, too, about this Passover. It wasn't just, it was anyone was able to partake in this. It was open to people from other nations if they came in and, you know, if they made the Lord their God in, the, in the, the, the nation of Israel, people of other nations were always able to come in and join themselves, make God their God, and partake in the Passover and receive the same blessing and, you know, receive salvation just like anyone else could. It was never exclusive to one racial group or ethnic group. It's always open to anyone uh, that wanted to believe. <coughs> so let's turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a lot of references about leaven, too, about not having leaven. Get it out of your house. Not leaven for seven days. You know, all of this no leaven. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We see another reference in the New Testament to leaven. Verse number six, the Bible reads, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, that's a true statement just in general. Obviously, if you, if you know anything about leaven, it doesn't take much, and then it, it, gets, it mixes in and, and, and makes 
all the dough leavened, right? They, you mix in the leaven and it just spreads quickly throughout the whole thing. But what he's talking about then is taking care of sin, right? You allow sin, you just allow it to run, you just allow it to be there, to be present. He says, you just let that sit and fester. It's going to infect and get much worse and just kind of get into all areas and become a big problem. So verse 7 says, purge out therefore the old leaven. So get rid of that stuff. Don't let it grow. Don't let it continue. Purge it that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. We're unleavened in Christ. We're made free from our sin for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So there is clearly the Bible calling Christ our Passover. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And, you know, you want to partake tonight in the Lord's Supper and partake of this unleavened bread, you know, it ought to be done in sincerity and in truth also. And there was a problem, he addresses this later, let's just go ahead and, and cover this right now, 1 Corinthians 11, he brings up this concept in chapter 5, and then he goes into people that need to be purged from the church and people who commit sins there later in that chapter, in chapter 5. But we're going to read through real quickly here in chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 20, When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. This doesn't sound like the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, if they're acting this way in the church. He's saying everyone's taking before other his own supper. People are not being mindful for others. They're not being courteous. They're not being kind. They're not kindly affection, showing brotherly love. If they're going like, no, get out of my way. I'm going to take this food, and I'm going to eat this, right? This is a problem. This is not how you observe the Lord's Supper at all. It's not a free-for-all, and it's not, you know, one's hungry, another's drunken. You know, drunken, I don't, and, you know, honestly, because this is talking about eating, this whole verse, it's talking about eating, I was talking about being just drunken with food, like having over too much. Like someone doesn't have any, and this other guy has way too much, right? You're like, this guy's just totally full and can't even move. We've got to roll him out the door, and this other guy's real hungry. He, doesn't, he didn't get anything. Right, because people are just kind of cut in front of others, and this is this is how they're practicing this, right? And it says in uh, verse 22, "What have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? In this, I praise you not." And this is also, you know, the Lord's Supper. This isn't a big meal up here. Yeah. The observation of the broken body and shed blood of Christ. You know, you can, hopefully you ate a full meal at home or you're not expecting this to, to, to fill you up, okay? Because that's not the point of this. It's not to come and lust after food and be seeking that physical food. Like, like many of those who, who actually were around when Jesus fed the 5,000, right, and the 7,000, and then they were seeking him. He's like, you, you come to see me just because I fed you, right? Like, like essentially he's calling them out saying, you, you're only here because I gave you a free meal. Like you, you totally missed the whole point of that miracle. Like, yes, he was able to physically provide and physically feed the people, but there's so much more than that. Go to him. He's, he's the life giver. That bread of life is what you need. And he's able to provide to everybody. Just come unto him, and he's able to give that to you. But if you're just looking like, oh, man, I'm going to get another free meal. Maybe he's going to have another potluck, <laughs> and I could just have some, you know, fill my belly. No, you need to fill your soul, not your belly. <coughs> Let's keep reading here. He says, uh, so he's, he's rebuking them, saying, look, man, you know, don't you have houses to eat in? Verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. <coughs> this do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So this evening we're focused on the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. His death and his burial. On Sunday we're going to preach, I'm going to preach the resurrection. Right, because that completes the whole thing. But tonight we're observing the broken body, the shed blood in that death. It's extremely important. He says, you know, when you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you're showing what Christ did for us. You're showing the sacrifice that he made. And he says, you do this in remembrance of me. And we're not going to let this slide, which is why we observe this once every year at this time of year to show the remembrance of what Christ did for us and to never forget that. And if there's something that's consistent, there's something that we're never going to stop doing, we're going to keep doing this practice every year so that even if as a church, the church apostatizes, you keep doing something like this, it's, there's a reason behind it, right? God has, has instituted uh, different things for, for people to do that it will show a testimony even in time to come, even when people kind of stray away from the Lord. And we're going to keep doing this so that the children growing up can, can get the, the, the learning, even if it's not known exactly what it is, there's a foundation being laid of the bread, of the wine, the blood, the body, the blood, the body, the blood, the body, so that maybe one day when they get older it'll click and they can understand, oh, now I understand what that was all about, right? And someone can show them the truth from the, from the scripture. Verse number 27 says, uh, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Obviously, you don't want to be found guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Right? It says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And then he says this, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For this cause, what cause? Well, he just said, because people are eating and drinking unworthily. Now, like I said, you could, you could debate what does it mean by eating and drinking unworthily. I think there's no debate about, you know, the worthiness of being saved. For, I mean, that is, there's absolutely no doubt that that is true. That is what this is talking about 100% for sure. You are unworthy if you're not saved. Because all of us are sinners and all of us are unworthy of Christ. We're all unworthy of, of any good gift from the Lord. We're, we are not worthy. But the only thing that gives us worth is Christ. So if Christ is in you, that makes you worthy because he's already washed you from your sins. That is where your worthiness comes from. But as I mentioned before and as we read in the Bible, there's always another aspect of things of living righteously, of being holy, sanctified, separate. In one sense, in Christ, we absolutely need that, of course. But there's another sense of how you live and how you walk and you know, getting the leaven out of your life that is also, I believe, applicable. Because we know that a man's going to reap what he sows, and we know that if someone, even if they're saved, and they're living like the devil, and then they just want to come in and eat and drink of, the, you know, of this body, which is something that's supposed to be uh, in remembrance of the Lord, and it, it's kind of denigrating, right? If their heart's not right, if they're, you know, if they're coming in doing this stuff, I mean, I would look at this, I, I think it makes sense that why many in the church are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. I didn't think, I don't think it's just because there were so many people that were unsaved in the church. Maybe it is. It's a possibility. I'm not dogmatic about it. But there's enough other evidence about, um, you know, getting the leaven out of your house, making sure you don't have the leaven there, and, and all of the, the um, references to having, um, to, to keeping yourself pure, right? But you judge yourself. It says, it says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Well, who does the Lord chasten? His children. Amen. He's not chastening the unbeliever. They've got the wrath of God abiding on them. He's chastening his sons. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. 
Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. So you notice that when we started reading this, it says, when ye come together, in verse 20, therefore into one place, it is, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. But he's explaining how it's not to eat the Lord's Supper because then he finishes it up by saying, wherefore, now after saying all of this stuff and pointing out all these problems, when you come together to eat. So you do come together to eat. Tarry one for another. So instead of pushing other people out of the way, <laughs> no, you don't do that at all. It's the exact opposite. You tarry one for another. Right? We're going to be respectful. We do everything decently and in order and, and have respect and reverence for the whole observation and remembering Christ. It's not here just to get a free meal. And that's what it says in verse 34, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That you come not together unto condemnation. And, you know, just one last point. How He's talking to people, he's, he's clearly talking to people who are saved. How are we going to come together unto condemnation just if you're hungry? Except it be the condemnation isn't a condemnation in hell. It's a condemnation of the chastening of the Lord. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Now, turn if you would to Psalm 22. We're just about, I'm just about ready to wrap it up. I've got more scripture than, than I'm going to get through tonight. I think, I think we'll probably just close, well, yeah. Psalm 22. I can't do Psalm 22 and not do Matthew 27, so we're going to do both. But toni tonight, the whole purpose is to be, one, showing the, the, that Christ was our Passover, showing all these different references and all the fulfillment of the Passover lamb from the Old Testament and how Jesus Christ fulfilled that in the New Testament, but also what he went through and the observation of the death of Christ. So we're going to be remembering the broken body and the shed blood. Well, let's really look at, you know, kind of think in our minds as we read the scripture, what that cost Christ. And actually let it sink in. We talk about the death of Christ a lot. We could talk about the death, burial, resurrection. But tonight we're going to think about it a little bit more. And just, and, 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 and ponder it in your heart. And think back to what it must have been like for the Savior because everything that he did, he did for you. I don't want us to, to be like the spoiled children that are not thankful for what was done for them. And the, and the less you realize and the less you think about what was done for you, the easier it is to have that spoiled brat attitude of just expecting everything to come your way and not being as respectful with the Lord as you ought to be, not being respectful of what he did for you and of how you ought to be living your life based on what Christ did for you. So let's look at some of the things that he had to endure and that what Christ went through during his death for you because you sinned. He didn't sin. If you didn't sin, he wouldn't have had to do that. If I didn't sin, he wouldn't have had to do that, right? If we all just could have obeyed God and did what he told us to do, then he wouldn't have had to go and die on the cross for us. But no, we sinned. So in a sense, we sent him to the cross. And thank God for his mercy and grace and, and giving us a free gift, but don't ever forget what was paid and what, and what was done as the sacrifice. You know, I talk about people who don't believe that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell, but you know what? I talk about that a lot, but, but let's not forget also everything that he went through because it was all important and all of it was, was significant. Psalm 22, we're going to see this um, prophecy of Christ on the cross. Verse number six, the Bible says, but I am a worm and no man. This is how people viewed Christ as subhuman on the cross. A reproach of men and despised of the people. So not only is Christ crucified, but I mean, people hate him. I mean, imagine just being, you know, hanging up on that cross. You're already being tortured. 
And then all you have to look at is people who hate you and people that, that want to see your death and people who are mocking you and ridiculing you while you're up in that position. This is what they were doing to Jesus. Verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. Jesus was spent. I mean, he was just, I mean, he was literally poured out. His blood was pouring out from him. His life force was pouring out from him. I mean, he is just exhausted and spent. And all my bones are out of joint. But notice not one of his bones was broken, by the way. But all of his bones were out of joint. I mean, he's hanging there, and his bones are literally just coming out of joint from hanging up on that cross. I mean, just the, the, the amount of pain. He was whipped. He was beaten. They covered him. They beat him with a reed. They put a crown of thorns on his head. I mean, I don't like pricking my finger on one thorn. We got a rose bush by my mailbox, and sometimes, you know, like, you get a little scratch from that. I don't like that. Okay, and, and he had a whole, you know, a whole crown made of thorns, and not only did they, I'm sure they didn't set it nicely on his head because they were mocking him, but not only did they place it on his head, they beat him on top of the head. I mean, they took a reed and beat him on the head with that crown of thorns on his head. So what that's going to do is going to drive those thorns into his head. And they whipped him, and they mocked him, and they were clothing him in these robes to try to make fun of the fact that he is the king, that he's the prince, that he's the king of the Jews, mocking him. It says, all my bones are out of joint there in verse 14. My heart is like wax. It melted in the midst of my bowels. His heart just sunk. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. I mean, that when your, your mouth is that dry, I mean, he had no liquid. Like, he's literally just, his fluids were drained from him. He's hanging there. His body is just literally just, just completely dying all, you know, to the point where when your mouth gets that, I mean, have you ever had that before? Where it's just dry and sticky, something you breathe, if you have to breathe through your mouth or you sleep or something and you wake up and like you just like it's uncomfortable but the torture then of being in the position that he was in it's just one more element on top of everything else i mean so you kind of add every little piece you talk about the crown of thorns like well oh that's not that bad but add everything together right aggregate it all sum it all together and he's dealing with all of this stuff all at once and then they're trying to give him what to drink vinegar but he's saying his, his mouth is so dry, you'd want like anything wet, but you don't want vinegar going into your mouth when you're that thirsty. All he wanted was, a, you know, like a drop of water, and they're messing with him and, and giving him stuff that's going to cause even more problems for him. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. He was nailed to the cross. I may tell all my bones. Tell means he can count them. They look and stare upon me. They whipped him and beat him so bad he can see his bones. I mean, imagine looking down and just being able to see your bones. That's pretty bad. It's pretty severe laceration to be able to look and see your bones. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. This is in Psalm 22. Turn if you go to Matthew 27. We'll see all of this come to pass in the gospel, in the testimony of, of Matthew.
Verse number 27, we're going to start reading. Matthew 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. There's that mocking attitude. We read about that in Psalm 22. They're wagging their head. They're shaking their heads at him. They're reviling him. All of this while he's crucified, nailed to the cross. He said, hey, why don't you come down from the cross if you're the Son of God? Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. No, you won't, you stinking hypocrite liar. Yeah. You can't believe. <laughs> That's why when the Bible said he was compassed about with dogs, yeah. these are the dogs. Yeah. 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 These are those wicked dogs. That, that can't be saved, saying, mocking him and, and, and doing all this manner of evil. And, and they are the ones responsible for his death, too, by the way. <laughs> Verse 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Christ was forsaken for our sake. I mean, imagine, just think about the gravity of what Christ did for you. Christ, the only begotten Son of God, lives the perfect life. He's always, he's working for his Father day and night. He's healing. He's preaching. He's, he's preaching the Word of God. He's taking nothing for himself. He's giving of himself completely for other people, healing, 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 performing miracles, doing all this stuff, doing all of this great work. Everything he did was right. Everything was righteous. He was right on. He's royalty. This is God in the flesh. He's pleasing the Father. Every single thing he's doing right. He's rejected. He's arrested. He's whipped. He's beaten. He's mocked. He's got people, you know, these wicked, sinful human beings mocking the Prince of Peace, mocking the Almighty God, and, and getting down on their knees and doing all this stuff to him, whatever they would. On top of all of that, then he's seeing all these people hating on him. He's suffering the physical pain and anguish from every element of the crucifixion, the spitting, the shame, and no one is there for him. Even the Heavenly Father that he pleased his entire life forsook him on the cross. There's a reason for that. The Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Because when he gave of himself, it was out of love for every single one of us and everything he endured. As much as, and you know, even right before all this, he said, you know, Father, you know, um, you know let this cup pass from me. Like, if, if it's possible at all, I, I don't want to have to go through with this. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what, what thou wilt. He's faithful in the death. 
And he suffered the shame, even the shame of the cross. He suffered and bled and died on the cross for us to the point where he was up there forsaken. And then he dies up on that cross and then it wasn't even over then because his soul went to hell. And thank God, three days, three nights later, he rose again from the dead and we'll cover the resurrection on Sunday. <coughs> but we're going to reflect on, on what Christ did for us. Everything that he went through is for your sin. That's it. That's, that's why he did it. But it's because he loves you and that was the only way possible for you to be saved. For you to, to be reconciled unto the Father. So as we partake tonight, we're going to be looking at the broken bread. Okay, this is, this is uh, uh, crunchy. There's no leaven in it. It's not moist. There's not, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a bread. And when we, when we partake of that, I want you thinking about Christ's body, because it was literally physically broken to the point of having nails pounded through his hands, and his, his flesh was so broken he could see his own bones. And as we then get our juice cups and, and look at that red wine, unfermented wine, we're going to look at that and remember all of the blood. I mean, this is just a little tiny sample that we have, a little tiny piece, but we're remembering what Christ did for us when he shed his blood on the cross for us and, and everything that he endured. But let's bow eyes for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, for that great sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I pray that you please just uh, bless this time tonight. And um, Lord, we're humbled. We can't thank you enough. I pray that you would please help us to consider our lives as we, as we, after we leave tonight and, and make sure that we're living lives that would be uh, representative of the love that we have for you, for loving us, and for, for giving us salvation, and for all the things that you've done for us, dear Lord. Help us to put our own problems in perspective in comparison to what Christ has done for us, Lord, and help us to, um, to overcome our flesh daily, that we would be able to get the leaven out of our houses, dear Lord, and serve you in righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.